Near Dark, 1987 movie review and thoughts. I'm going to start by telling you this was a movie that I loved. I acknowledge aspects of it are problematic. I'm going to try to explore them best I can. And the video will have some jokes, none of the expense of members and minorities, and we'll get into some serious topics. If you're looking for a view that's like, oh, the movie doesn't really hold up, it's been outdone by little movies, because of that, it's not that much fun to watch today. Whether you agree with that is or not, this is not that review. I realize this video is long, I'm doing what I can to make it worth your time. So, I start the video with a review where I'm almost definitely not going to spoil anything. If I, over the course of the review, decide that I want to spoil something, I'm going to verbally warn before I do so and hold up an index finger so you can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. As soon as I end the review itself, again, into the thought sections, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers, including discussing the ending. And, yeah, so this movie is rated R. And there are definitely times where it is a hard R. So the IMDb Parents Guide, yeah, says sex and nudity as none, violence and gore as severe, profanity and frightening and intense scene as moderate, alcohol, drugs and smoking as mild. And yeah, it's definitely yeah. I will. The, the Yeah, I guess this is a perfectly fine place to briefly talk about. The violence is quite visceral. It's like, it's not quite like David Cronenberg, but that's perfectly fine. You know, it's like some of the harsher of John Carpenter's movies. And I do think they made the right choice. I, I don't think this movie would have been better if there was more sexuality and nudity or you know more or less profanity and I think you know I'm I'm one of the the weirdos who thinks that when you make a vampire movie there should be violence I, I don't I've never felt like it made a lot of sense you know I really hope that Blade in the MCU will be bloodier and violenter than that's not the right way to say that. More bloody. You know, the, the um, yeah, that was one of many problems with Morbius. And yes, so the, um, yes, I have watched this once. I just got done watching it right before I hit record on this video. And... Yes, so the, the plot, I'm just going to quote IMDb here because they do quite a good job. A small town farmer's son reluctantly joins a traveling group of vampires after he is bitten by a beautiful drifter. And yeah, um, the, the technical aspects are quite impressive. There's a lot of skill and enthusiasm on display. And let's see the um, yeah. So this was written by Eric Red and Catherine Bigelow, and I'm not hugely familiar with with either of them. Um, yeah, looking across the list, like. Yeah, the, the thing that Eric Red is perhaps best known for is The Hitcher, which I would very much like to, to watch. I've heard a lot of really great things. I'm looking for a, a copy on sale online. Uh, let's see. Yeah, he wrote for uh, Catherine Bigelow a few other times, such as Blue Steel. Steel. And... It's, yeah, and the only other thing than the, the only thing other than this that I've watched that he's written. Oh, and he directed that one as well. Wow. Um, Bad Moon, the the movie where Michael Pare plays a vampire, the uh, werewolf. Yeah, apparently they they, they like. 
he likes to write about you know vampires and werewolves I believe blue steel oh never mind I'm, I must be thinking of something else anyway but yeah he's written these two at least about yeah um, bad moon I think Obscura's Lupa put it perfectly when she described the movie as its rear window if a dog noticed a werewolf. That's an absolutely spot-on description of that movie. Uh, it's more fun than it has any right to be. It's honestly... I've, I've watched it several times on purpose. Yeah, it's legitimately, like, just... Yeah, it's... Yes. Um, okay, now I got a real quick look. What else has he directed? Yeah, he's directed a couple of other things that he wrote. Gunman's Blues. Uh, let's see. Cohen and Tate. Telephone. Body Parts Undertow. 100 Feet. Yeah. There, there are several things that he's... Yeah, um, but yeah, he wrote it with Catherine Bigelow, and this is only the second thing I watch that she's directed, and I guess it is the first thing that she's written. That I, yeah, that's right. Yeah, she she has not written a huge amount. She wrote Blue Steel. She co-wrote Blue Steel. And Undertow. She wrote an episode of The Equalizer, the the show, not the any of the movies, and something called The Loveless, which she also directed. Yeah, you know, the the she she's much more known for her direction. Other than this, the only thing I've watched by her is Strange Days. And yeah, honestly I'm I'm quite impressed with both of these. She's clearly incredibly talented. Yes, I know, you don't have to tell me. I know I should watch The Hurt Locker and Zero Dark Thirty. Maybe I will at some point. I haven't been, like, avoiding them. And obviously, Point Break. Th those are the three movies that everyone thinks of when they hear her name, other than this one. And certainly also Strange Days, but yeah. Um, the... the there's a lot of really excellent traits to the screenplay. There is a very real sense of, of grit and authenticity to this. Like, you know, yeah, they're basically, these vampires are drifters, you know, and because it's the 80s and it's gritty, of course, there's allusions to drugs. The, the thing with being a vampire, you know, one character straight up asks, what drug are you on to to someone who's who's a vampire you know he doesn't know that this is a vampire he's talking to but yeah it's very it, it really does feel like this is you know we're we're witnessing some of what the the lives of these drifters are is which you know um yeah the hitcher you could also say is about a, a drift you know Literally a hitcher, hitchhiker, and and that was something I you know I I am not old enough to remember the eighties, but I do I am aware that there were you know there was some media attention to the concept of drifters and hitchhikers. There was some anxiety around that whole thing, and yeah, like you know to to some extent this movie is this thing of you know Adrian Pazdar's Caleb you know he has to he has to make a decision between you know being part of polite society or joining these drifters and kind of being irresponsible you know it is yeah, it is one of those stories, and it does that quite well. I've, I've, you know, I'm familiar with a lot of those stories. Not, a f not familiar with a huge amount of them where they are like vampires. I, I'm not sure I know 
another story. I'm, I'm, I'm you know maybe they're maybe they exist and I'm just not familiar with them. But another story where vampires are like drifters. Maybe Lost Boys. I haven't watched that one. I have seen a number of people again haven't been like avoiding it though. You know, sadly, you know we do now know that the director was, you know, a sexual predator. But I've seen some people say that, oh, um, you know, the fact that Near Dark didn't do that well at the box office, you know, the, the like, oh, I guess people just wanted something more like Lost Boys. You know, it's a pretty significant aspect of it that Lost Boys had a much higher advertising budget you know that's a big part of the reason why way more people went to to watch that this i i there there are a number of people who absolutely love this when it came out there's a lot of people who probably would have loved it if they knew it existed now the yeah, so, so usually I bring this up later in my videos, but I do briefly want to talk about, so the Blu-ray that, that I have, you know, and yeah, just so you know it's out there. I'm not saying every Blu-ray you can find of this has this, but there's a director's commentary, and it's feature length this time, not like Strange Days where it's like 30 minutes of a two-hour movie, and... Catherine Bigelow is extremely articulate. Like, it's clear she put a great level of thought into her movies before and during making them and expresses that very well. It's a joy to listen to her talk about filmmaking. In addition, the Blu-ray features one and a half minutes of deleted scenes with director's commentary. You know, they're, they're interesting, they're incomplete, but you do see what they were going for. So th this is kind of one of those where they, oh, you know, we still had this on the cutting room floor, let's scrape it off and, you know, b blow it up to, to modern quality and put it on the, on the Blu-ray. And a 47 and a half minute behind the scenes called Living in Darkness. Very informational, you learn a lot about how they made the movie. They take you from script stage through production. There's also a still gallery and the two-minute red band trailer. And I'm not sure how much I'm going to be quoting, but I will say I recommend reviews from critics and users, at least the first five pages of user reviews, on Rotten Tomatoes, Metacritic, and yeah, there's a number of the top 100 on IMDb, except the very low-rated ones. Those, Some of those just... Don't, I, I don't mind. I, I love negative reviews of media that I find engaging. There's just there's a lot of these where they don't even really say anything. They just say, I did not like this. And it's like, I mean, if you can't put words to it. I, I try not to make, not to do reviews of something if I can't engage with the what, what it's trying to do and or put words to why I thought it was good or bad. I don't I don't think that's super you know yeah, you're kind of just backing up the you know people are gonna find your review, not get anything out of it, and stop reading reviews and miss out on well written reviews. Anyway, the right and the IMDB trivia is also worth reading. I've seen some people say, oh you know it's it's just too dark. I think I think they've been unfortunate enough to have to be stuck with versions that just aren't like you know the the yes yeah, so the blu-ray that I have is digitally restored. I think if you're stuck watching a copy that isn't yeah, I can imagine it's it's too dark. It, it, it's one of these things where in 1987 if you were making, you know, this was not a big budget movie yeah, a lot of movies that were not made for big budget were made for the cinema experience. They weren't really made for watching it again later on a much smaller screen in in the the quality that ended up, you know, 
So, so yeah, you know, if you've read a review that says, oh, it's just too dark, but you kind of want to watch the movie, make sure you get a version that has been digitally restored, because that's, it, I think there was one shot where for a few seconds, like two or three seconds, I was like, ah, I can't, can't really make out what's going on there. It was a transitionary shot. It wasn't a big deal. It was just, you know, they're driving from point A to point B. The fact that I couldn't quite see anything other than, okay, a car is moving really wasn't a, a problem. But I can absolutely, I, I can, there, there's a lot of night shooting in this. You know, there are vampires and all. And if you're fortunate enough to have access to a digitally restored version, it looks gorgeous. It is deeply impressive how, yeah. This movie gets a lot out of the unpredictability of Bill Paxton, R.I.P. He could do pretty much any mood. Angry, cowardly, proud, scared. You never really knew exactly which one he would give you next, how he would react to a certain situation. He was the biggest wild card in Aliens, and he's even better here. Like this, I think this is my favorite performance of his. It's, it's amazing. Just... You can't take your eyes off him. You know, there's, like, just, yeah, every every little, and every, every line, every inflection, all the little, and apparently some of it was actually, like, ad-libbed. Like, he got the character so much that he could come up with stuff. Just, yeah. Um, honestly, if you're a big fan of him, you gotta watch this movie just, at, at least once, just for his performance. He is, he is just breathtaking and the f I at first I was slightly torn on the fact that you know he is not the lead I I, I haven't s gotten to watch that many movies where he got to play the lead honestly I think possibly the only one I've, I've watched is a simple plan where he's excellent not quite as unpredictable but he gives a much more subtle and you know yeah, low-key performance there than in a lot of his other roles. At first I was torn. You know, did I wish that he was the lead here? But honestly, the fact that he's not kind of means that we never know exact like essentially I I don't I don't want to give away exactly how much of this movie he's in, but you feel like he, you know, he's he is very, like at times he behaves in a very careless manner, and you kind of wonder if he's going to keep being around, and yeah, that adds to the unpredictability, and it's just, yeah, it's, he's, he's just so entertaining in this. Now, based on some behind the scenes, the bar scene was as much fun to shoot as it is to watch. And I've seen some people say, oh, you know, the, some of the people in that scene, you know, why are they reacting the way they are to the circumstance? I think it's important to know, and I don't think it makes the movie any lesser. I just think, you know, I, I get that for some people, you know, it, it, this is one of those movies where you either get into the groove or you kind of find a lot of stuff really frustrating, but this is not completely realistic. It's There's definitely times where you kind of wonder why characters are doing what they're doing, and if you just let it sweep you with, you know, if, yeah, if you let yourself be taken by the movie, then that's not a problem at all. But I get that some people just refuse to do that and I you know I'm I'm not hating I used to be like that I just eventually you know t today I, I feel like that's you're cutting yourself off from so much entertaining you know so many movies so many shows but yeah and yeah on the behind the scenes they talk about both the difficulty and power of lighting night scenes and their work is deeply impressive there are some phenomenal nighttime scenes in this that use shadow and even silhouette. There's one shot that, like, yeah, I, I, there's not enough silhouettes in, in recent movies, because it, it really, nothing quite has the power of a silhouette shot. In the behind the scenes, Adrian Pazdar talks about how Jenny Wright is the kind of woman that a man would cheat on his wife with and says that he still thinks about her, he still misses her, 
you know, and, and keep in mind, uh, let's see, this is, I'm going to find, oh, right here, I have it right here. Um, it, that documentary is from 2002, so 15 years later. So, depending on whether or not, right, right, and the, uh, let's see, yeah, he says he still thinks about her, really misses her, depending on whether or not she reciprocates. This is either romantic or creepy, and the person editing the behind the scenes, including it, either means that he agrees with Adrian, or he wanted to get Adrian in trouble with Jenny and or Adrian's wife. If he was married at the time, I don't, but it's just, or, you know, potential future wife or something, yeah. And I would definitely say that is something the, 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 um, uh, let's, oh, right, that's right, I, I did, hold on, I have some here, yes, um, while some say that they do have chemistry, there are a number of people who say that the chemistry between, between Caleb and May, you know, played by Janie Wright, is slim to nil. I'm not sure that she really wanted to be doing the love story. She looks visil visibly uncomfortable in parts, which might also explain why she did not join most of the rest of the main cast for the 2002 documentary. You know, the... Yeah. Um, I don't think I've seen her in anything else, but... This is, she does a fantastic job when she's playing aloof and playing a vampire. Like, everyone who plays a vampire in this does a fantastic job. I don't think that she really, the, the, the romance itself kind of feels like she didn't really want to be doing, I, I don't, you know, I'm not gonna, I haven't found anything in, in, my minimal research for this. I don't know if she didn't really like him, if she didn't like the writing. I'm not sure, but, you know, yeah, it definitely... The fact that the, the love story has so little chemistry and that they're, you know, it's, it's a really important aspect of the movie, like... The fact that the two of them, at least supposedly, love each other, are in love, that's a huge, like, it, it changes so many things, because, like, he really only stays with the vampires because he wants to be with her, she really wants to keep him alive, that's why the other vampires don't kill him immediately. And, yeah, the, f the fact that it doesn't really work, if, yeah, like, it didn't ruin the movie for me, but I can understand why it ruined the movie for other people. And the, some people don't really like the, the, this thing of, you know, I, th I let's see, I think... Catherine Bigelow herself refers to it as evil family versus good family, where the, the vampires are the evil family that Caleb is trying to join, and the good family, his father and his sister, are, you know, trying to find him. He he disappeared, and they're, they're concerned about him. Some people think that that was too big of a part of the movie. I have to completely disagree. I think the movie, I, I don't, I don't think the movie would completely work if you took out the good family, if it was just, because that really is the moral center of it. Other, otherwise, it just is the story of, like, two young people, well, one young person and a vampire who still looks young, you know, in love and doing kind of stupid things because of love and yeah I don't know I'm, I'm not saying that movies like that don't have a place I'm just not sure it's super interesting to do that story with vampires but this thing of you know is he going to be responsible or is he going to 
just yeah live out you know they, they, some people fantasize about this some people like the idea of being able to live without rules and you know again I don't remember the year 1987 I was literally a baby but from watching a bunch of movies from the 80s I can appreciate certainly there was some anxiety around the idea that young people you know there's always been that anxiety but it was in some ways more intense let's see I think it was the, the 60s and the 80s that was that fear was very intense of young people not becoming productive members of society and you know yeah just living out these you know just yeah living a life without any rules and yeah the the fact that you have this this contrast between the two families is in my opinion central to to making it work otherwise it would just come across as kind of a, a bitter harsh like yeah it, it would almost feel like a, like a sour grapes kind of thing like ah you know if I can't live this carefree life then nobody gets to you know because there's definitely like I mentioned some of the violence is very visceral the movie has a I'm, I'm not the first person to point out the movie has a definite mean streak and the fact that at the end of the day, you know, there is some chance that Caleb is going to leave this vampire family and go back to his blood relatives, the, the ones, his relatives that don't want to suck blood. And, yeah, like, the, yeah, we're, we're constantly, like, we're, we're hoping that he'll do the right thing. I have to admit, in everything James Cameron has directed her in, I found Jeanette Goldstein to be quite asexual. She's a mother in Titanic and Terminator 2. Well, Terminator 2, I suppose, you know, adoptive mother, but still. And I realize in real life, mothers can be sexual beings, but they aren't in those movies. You know, I, I, I'm not sure that James Cameron is the most comfortable with it. Like, you'll also note that, like, Sarah Connor you know also not the most sexual especially once the the fact that you know oh she's the mother of the future you know yeah i i i think he's it's it's a little see, is that freudian it's it's a you know i i appreciate you know he's oh we want to protect mothers but it's I don't think that it needs to go quite as, as far as, but anyway, um, you know, I don't think mothers should be pressured into being sexual beings, but I don't think anybody should be pressured into sex, so, yeah. And in Alien, she's quite masculine, Jeanette Goldstein's quite masculine, which I appreciate some people probably feel she oozes sex in that, and I'm not saying that's wrong, you know, whatever floats your votes. I, you know, I don't think that Cameron, you know, he's, he's said that he doesn't think that you know let's see the i think he specifically said it about uh, sarah connor but you know there's also some of it in vasquez and uh ellen ripley you know he doesn't he he likes these masculine asexual kind of you know m mother some, sometimes motherly kind of badass women but yeah, so it's very interesting to see Jeanette Goldstein in in this where like she's got cleavage. She's literally wearing a corset for a lot of her screen time. She's very provocative and looks and just you know like like yeah, her eyes. It's yeah, like she's basically a femme fatale and she does really really great at it. I. Honestly, I think if I had watched this like 10, 20 years ago, I might not still remember that that was Jeanette Goldstein because when I think of her, like, you know, first of all, I think Vasquez. You know, second would be the. I, th I guess it is Jeanette, isn't it? Todd and Jeanette. Something like that, you know, and yeah, also the, the yeah, Titanic, you know. 
but but yeah, she she really does excellent. I I honestly I I wonder these are the only things I've seen. Oh wow, she's in Clock Stoppers. I completely forgot about that. Alien. Wow. Okay, evidently I've seen her in more stuff than I remember. Janelle, not Jeanette. Janelle Voigt. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I kind of wonder if in some of those others, she's, oh, very cool. She, she was in something just 2019. Very cool. Um, but, but yeah, you know, I, it's, it's one of those things where like there's other, there are other actors where they can do either a really sexual performance or they can do these asexual kind of things, but they can't really do both well, but yeah, she she really does a, a fantastic job. And um yes, uh I I think I ended up not writing it in, but but yeah, this does you know, th this was made not very long after Aliens and yeah, Lance Henriksen, Bill Paxton, and Jeanette Goldstein were also you know, here they play a family of vampires in that they, you know, yeah, two of them are marines and the third, I actually, come to think of it, I don't, I'm not sure I could put words to exactly what it is. Doctor, maybe? I Honestly, I don't remember. S scientist, maybe, but yeah. You know, they, they work together there. And here, you know, so it's the 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 chemistry is very much there, and yeah, honestly, like I could watch ten or twenty movies where the three of them, you know, yeah, in in one way or another, they have to spend a lot of screen time. They have to share a lot of screen time, you know, because they're just so good. And it's not one of those oh, they're just playing this up. No, it's very their their characters are incredibly different here from Alien. And their relationships also, like um, in the you know Lance Henriksen here is much more of a dominant force than he is in Aliens, and you know yeah the three the the three actors portray good guys in Aliens and very very bad guys and one gal in, in this. Now, these vampires, they're not trying to rule the world like Blade vampires. They come across as full of, not not as full of ennui over their condition as and Rice vampires can, but just plain bored. They behave as if there are no consequences because they have no real reason not to. There haven't been consequences. You know, it's a fairly cynical view, and again, this is very much, you know, like it if you if you made this movie and they weren't vampires you wouldn't necessarily have to change a huge amount about this this is how some people saw like drifters and hitchhikers in the 80s this just yeah oh they they live without rules and they're just you know cuz cuz capitalism hates anything that it, any any individual person that cannot be exploited for labor so yeah but but yeah, I, I hugely disagree. You know, some some people really take issue with the fact that the vampires behave in in this way, and I some of some of them don't seem to try to engage with. You know, there's there's a reason for it. Like there's there's several mentions of the fact that they've been around for a long time. You know, I I don't know if I want to give it away. I, I think I might talk about it in the spoiler sections, but. There's a line that tells you how long at least one of them has been a vampire, and yeah, like, you know, it is this thing of, let's see, had we, was this before, I guess the first Anne Rice, was that maybe Interview, which is from 94, Interview with a Vampire, I'm not entirely sure, I'm, this won't take long to... Oh, I forgot. Anne Rice passed. R.I.P. Uh, let's see. Yeah, these were 
yeah, the, the, oh, that's right, she wrote the screenplay in addition to the novel. Yeah, so this was before Anne Rice vampires made it to the silver screen. I'm pretty sure they'd already been, let's see if we interview with a vampire. 1976, so is, is the book. It's released here. So, so yeah, you know, this is a, you know, there were people who knew those kinds of, of vampires before this. So, yeah, this is, you know, yeah, it's a, it's a challenge to that, similar to how data on Star Trek The Next Generation, which I want to say that started airing in 1987, you know, that came out just a few years after the Terminator from 1984, and they have very different opinions on whether it is potentially a good thing or potentially a bad thing that, you know, in the future we might have androids, robots that look human. I'm not saying that that's, that's not a diss on either, you know, one of my favorite movies, nor a, a show that I do quite respect for what it's brought to, to pop culture. It's not my favorite, you know, I'm always going to prefer Deep Space Nine if we're talking Star Trek. Now, uh, some people have called out the fact that the police don't really seem to be investigating all these vampires killing, which happened, you know, the stuff that happened before the events of the film very much. I think this might come from the fact that before other genres were embraced, this was initially intended as a Western, a genre where famously law enforcement tends to be down to one anti-hero, a cowboy passing through town, and they just didn't change this after adding these other genres. And whether this is a bug or a feature depends on the viewer. I personally think it works fine. You know, it, it adds to the sense of cynicism, almost nihilism of the film. You know, it is a snapshot d depicting a world that, you know, just, yeah, thankfully is very, very different from our own in, in a number of ways. Lance Henriksen can be quite the obnoxious jerk when preparing for a movie. Apparently it does help his process, though I'm not sure I would really say that justifies it. Some of the details in the IMDb trivia section and the behind-the-scenes video, which appears to be where those IMDb trivia entries are getting their information from. But but yeah, I will say, you know, he's, he's great. Like, this, this is a movie packed with really compelling performances. You know, I... I'm not sure I would say that there's a single performance that gets a lot of screen time in this that isn't excellent. You know, I've, I've seen some people, uh, let's see, I think some people thought that Tim Thomerson, who plays the the father, Loy, Caleb's father, I feel like I read some people thought it was boring. I you know, he's he's supposed to be like, oh, the moral center, so, you know, he's not necessarily going to be the most, you know, it's he's supposed to stand in stark contrast. He's actually, he's one of the only male characters in this who don't do very much, if any, like, macho bullshit. Uh, I've seen some people say they didn't like Joshua John Miller as Homer. I I mean, I, I tried. I just, I, I don't see what they mean. I... I thought he was fantastic. And, yeah, so I cannot speak to the rest of her filmography, but certainly in both this and Strange Days, Catherine Bigelow sets up scenes in a way where situations that are scary for women are handled with male gaze. We're meant to empathize with the man doing the messed up thing more than the woman who's being abused. I don't know if this reflects her values. I'd like to think not. Or if this was something she did to have an easier time making these very masculine movies as a woman in a male-dominated field. It's too bad, because a lot of the time James Cameron, who she collaborated with during the time making these, frequently does not do this. And the specific scene I'm referring to in, in this movie is very early when Caleb is attempting to seduce May. You know... And at, at least one point, she seems reluctant. She doesn't come across as playing hard to get, but like she changed her mind about being with him, 
and instead of accepting that withdrawal of consent, he jokes that he won't let her leave. The fact that it's a joke does not make it okay. It's still a violation of consent. And... Uh, let's see. So yeah, um, somehow IMDb only lists this as horror when honestly the the yeah I'm gonna real quick find the, the part where I because I wrote I tried to write out every single subgenre that this fits. Let's see. Here we go. Yeah, um, this is a neo. It is a noir neo western vampire horror coming of age romance biker gang road movie drug family drama. You know, like it's <laughs> when when someone you know someone asked Catherine Bigelow which genre should this movie be, and she went yes, like. There's almost none, there's almost no genre missing. Like, let's see, I guess, like, comedy and musical are pretty much the uh, history, you know. But, yeah, it just, and, and it actually manages to, to really nail all of them. It's, it's wild. I'm not going to give away whether it's a happy ending or a sad ending, but the ending does fit at least some of what came before. I think the ending is great. I know some people really don't like it. Some some people really hate the last 30 minutes. And I can appreciate where they're coming from. I will talk more about it in detail in the spoiler sections. Um, I, th I think, again, it's, it's very important to take the movie on its premises. Uh, you know, it... The ending is very natural for the movie that they were making, and... You know, unfortunately, some people were hoping for a different movie and then complained that the movie wasn't different from what it was, you know, promising that it was going to be. But, yeah. And let's see. The um, brings us. So, yeah, the. Yes, let's talk about the characters. So. There's not an awful lot to Caleb himself. He's kind of a blank slate. He's very, like, you know, audience. Every audience member can project, uh, you know, yeah. He's a he's young. He, you know, he would like to be part of society, but the you know there is this temptation, and yeah, you know, honestly, it's kind of a waste of Adrian Pazdar. I will say. He does everything he can to sell the romance, which, you know, apparently he was attracted to her in real life, so maybe it was maybe it didn't require a lot of acting. Oh, huh, he's in Top Gun. Did not know that. Um, yeah, this was this was ten years before my first the the first thing I was exposed to him in House of Frankenstein, where he also deals with vampires. So I don't know if that was just like. He had a vampire phase, and 19 years before Heroes, which is definitely the thing I've, you know, spent the most time watching that he plays an important role in, and, oh, huh, yeah, he's in, he's in the music video for Martini Ranch Reach, which is from 1988, so yeah, I guess they just brought him back from from this one he had a relationship with although that was James Cameron not Catherine Bigelow but maybe Catherine Bigelow was the person she was also she she appears in this she plays the posse leader you know if, if it's your kind of music and you like you know yeah James Cameron himself directed them the music video I, I believe it's the only music video he's ever directed you know, he's not really known for directing music videos it's more movies and the occasional you know, documentary and such. Yeah, yeah, it's the only music video he's ever directed, and it's is legitimately quite good. But yeah, I don't really have anything. Yeah, he is. You know, the the 
he's uh, Caleb is macho enough that young men from the time wouldn't feel bad you know imagining they were him and you know sensible enough that you know people who don't want to imagine being macho yeah you know I, I did not find it difficult to to follow him I just wish that the the romance had worked slightly better this is one of those things where you know he's neither like yeah he's he's closer to being likable than an interesting asshole he's definitely not particularly interesting Jenny writes may like I think she did yeah honestly yeah just every single vampire character in this does a good job getting across that there's much more you know they don't they're not the age that they appear to be they've been around for a long time and you know yeah have have yeah have have experienced things that regular human beings never will um yeah uh Lance Henriksen is is a lot of fun he's basically the leader of the vampires Jesse and yeah like the yeah honestly Jesse Severin and Diamondback all clearly enjoy the the violence even when like other people threaten them that's still something they enjoy you know Jesse there's this sense of like yeah you know there's there's kind of wisdom there like he is he he understands things and I think I might have said everything I want about Bill Paxton a Severin uh, he yeah he's definitely of the vampires in this movie of all the characters in this movie he legitimately like he loves he practically gets off on just like toying with like it's it's like he's he's a cat dangling a mouse in front of him and just taking forever before he he starts eating you know just yeah he's he's incredibly sadistic and just yeah he's he you cannot you cannot stop watching him and i think i may have said pretty much everything i have about Jeanette Goldstein's diamond back um she actually at times kind of acts like almost a mother to, to Homer, though that might be more like when people mistake Homer for still being a child rather than, you know, yeah, significantly older than he is. And yeah, um, Loy, Caleb's father, is very dedicated to to finding Caleb making sure he's safe and yeah Homer like there's this really interesting thing where there's almost like still some left of the the child that he was when he was bitten like because he talks about you know and some of the time he does act like he is an adult in a child's body not in the Michael Jackson way, and that's a Jimmy Carr joke. And the yeah, other times yeah, like uh, he rides a bicycle and you know he's watching TV and just uh, yeah, it's like these. It's it's very very interesting. I I really appreciate that they they have those those details. Um, I mean, it's not as fleshed out or quite as compelling as Kristen Stewart in Interview with a Vampire, but that's a mighty high bar to clear. And, yeah, this, um, this features the, the guy that Arnie, you know, yeah, the guy that he, he takes the clothes, boots, and motorcycle from in T2. You know, he's in this. Guess that guy just should probably not get 
in in bars because it does not seem to end well for him. But he has a presence. Like he, you know, you remember him from this and from T two. Like it's he really he makes an impression. You know when and and he's. He's essentially there to prove how strong his opponent is, you know, because he looks like this big, tough guy, and, yeah, you know, there's there's some actors who, you know, they have the, the look that they could, that you know, maybe pull that off, but they just, they have a little bit too much ego to, to be embarrassed by being beaten up in, in a movie. And... I think that might be about... Yeah, so the the dialogue, um, some people, I, I saw at least one person say, you know, oh, despite all the, the dialogue, I never felt like I got to know these characters. I do agree that, you know, there's a lot of, like, posturing and people bickering. Like, if I didn't know that this was not written by Paul W. S. Anderson, I would probably think. Yeah, I, I don't know if that's just Catherine Bigelow and or Eric Red's writing, but it was definitely in in this and to an extent Strange Days. Which right, Strange Days, she did not write. That was Cameron and Jay Cox. But yeah, um, you know, this is probably where this is one of those movies that helped put that idea in Paul W. S. Anderson's head. I would definitely say that she does it better. Uh, Bigelow does. I think she makes us want to see more of these characters in a way where, like, I'll admit, when I was a teenager, it didn't bother me as much, but Paul W. S. Anderson's writing and directing, like, you, I don't know. For some people, obviously it works, or he wouldn't keep doing it. But I've always found his characters to be quite frustrating, just constantly macho posturing, and, you know, even when it's, like, an incredibly bad idea. Like, there are Paul W. Sanderson movies where someone's macho posturing basically, like, completely ruins things for them and other people for a chunk of the movie, you know. And I didn't really feel like that was ever the case here. It, yeah. And let's see. I think that might be about right. So the this was filmed various parts of Arizona. And one thing is filmed in California, and they get a lot of authenticity out of this. It, yeah, it really feels like, you know, that this is almost real and puts it in the real world. Uh, the action is, is really, really good. Um, like, it's not quite, you know, it's not the best action of the 80s. Again, very high bar to clear. But, yeah, it was, like, I can understand why, like, there's some, some people's reviews, especially underline, you know, certain of the, of the action scenes in this as, you know, if, if you, when I, when I, you know, here on YouTube, if I type in near dark, you know, the trailer is one of the top ones. Then there's the bar zine. And, uh, yeah, I think that is what I will say on that. And, yeah, the music is great. Uh, there's some, um, they use some licensed music, including a, a cover, I believe it's not the original, at least, of Fever in the in the bar scene which really just works incredibly because you know that already that is a song about someone like being deeply affected by the presence of someone else and that's kind of what we're seeing you know you, on the one hand you have the vampires who see all these you know n you know walking meals and on the other you have these patrons 
who are getting increasingly alarmed by the presence of these you know to them it just looks like weirdos but yeah you know so that that's pretty much perfect choice there and yeah like the act the the, the music always works for what it's supposed to um let's see i think that might right also some really great sound design and yeah the movie is 91 minutes without end credits and this is I'm, I'm going off the uncut I meant to say that at the start of this video um, and 94 minutes with end credits and yeah um, I would probably if if you're if you're not interested 30 minutes in yeah the movie just might not be for you and some of the pacing I will grant is, uh, yeah, I, I don't know that I would say that it's like bad pacing, but there were definitely times where it felt like something, yeah, I can, I can understand why it really bothered some people. It didn't for me, but, and yeah, um, I almost already said this but just to underline the best element of this is the fact that it actually nails all these different subgenres and I think the worst aspect is probably the the lack of chemistry in the romance considering how important it is um, Something I saw other people say, some, some people thought that the movie was excessively violent. I appreciate that for 87, this was very violent. You know, not David Cronenberg violent, not The Thing from 1982 violent, but quite violent. I think that might be one of those things where it's aged really well. By today's standards, like I've I've seen movies, you know, recent movies that are much more violent than this, but th that's an aspect that holds up fairly well. And something that especially, you know, I saw several people really take issue with is how mean some of the violence is, and that definitely, is, you know, yeah. If if you think that might bother you, it probably will. And, yeah, the thing I was most worried about with this was that it would not be a strong directorial debut. I don't think I've mentioned that until this point, but this was the first solo feature directorial effort by Catherine Bigelow. And, no, the movie absolutely exceeded my expectations. This is very, very self-assured work. You know, like, obviously, she wasn't doing all this on her own, but she does... You know, the, the cinematographer does have to clear his work with, with the director. And, yeah, she has a very strong sense of how to film these various scenes. Whether it's horror, action, you know, romance, all these, yeah. That's another thing about the romance. I'm not sure that Catherine Bigelow herself was that sold on the romance I could be wrong but I didn't it at, at least it didn't feel like she was thinking you know oh you know wouldn't it be amazing to fall for you know 1987 Adrian Pazdar and let's see yeah the thing I was most looking forward to was more Catherine Bigelow and yeah, uh, you know, this was a recommendation by Arts Cafe, longtime subscriber, frequent commenter, and yeah, you know, fantastic. The, really greatly appreciate the the recommendation request, you know, but and the the yeah, he specifically requested that I cover this movie, but I am very glad he did so. The trailers definitely do give too much away, but do also give you a pretty good idea of what the movie is like. The cover and poster 
also give too much away and yeah just you know it can be difficult to completely avoid seeing but just try not to think about yeah but it does also give you know give you a sense of tone now let's see the yes that brings us to Rotten Tomatoes where it has an 83 percent from critics it is certified fresh uh, 75 reviews 62 of them fresh an average score of 7.40 the audience score is 74 percent based on more than 10,000 ratings the average rating is 3.7 out of 5 the consensus near dark is at once a creepy vampire film a thrilling western and a poignant family tale with humor and scares in abundance on Metacritic it has a 78 out of 100 from critics and 7.3 out of 10 from users and let's see so yeah 78 that's generally favorable and it's based on 18 critic reviews 16 of those are positive there's two mixed and none no negative ones and Let's see, so the two mixed ones, yeah, uh, the negative things, they they say, I, I guess, that yeah, maybe this is like a, I can't tell if it's a compliment or not. The movie features as much gore as the monster genre usually calls for nowadays. But they do also say lots of dull spots, and the other one says it's scattershot, and simple exhaustion, you know, agree to disagree. And the, uh, yeah, so 7.3 from users, that is also generally favorable. 78% of the ratings are, actually maybe, yeah, yeah, 25 positive ratings, 4 mixed, and 3 negative. And there's only 6 reviews one mix that I think is in Spanish for positive in English one negative in English and yeah I mean this person says you know there's better you know if you're looking for 80s vampire fiction there are better options like Fright Night or Lost Boys and yeah other than that, yeah, they say it's slow, childish, predictable. And then they say action-oriented, which I guess they mean as a negative, considering that it's surrounded by negative. And then they say without anything in particular, which I don't know what that sentence means. Now, on IMDb, it has a 6.9 out of 10, based on 44,000 ratings. 29.5% gave it 7, 21.8% 20, 20, gave it 8, 17.2% gave it 6, 8.6% gave it 9, 8.3% gave it 10, 7.6% gave it 5, 3.1% gave it 4, 1.5% gave it 3, 1.3% gave it 1, 0.9% gave it two so not necessarily like completely beloved but definitely more positive than negative there are 298 IMDb user reviews only 200 yeah and 217 if you hide spoilers and I read the top voted 100 of the spoiler free ones and of those four gave it one seven gave it two th ten gave it three five gave it four 3 gave it 5, 10 gave it 6, 22 gave it 7, 24 gave it 8, 10 gave it 9, and 8 gave it 10 out of 10. So, again, some people really love it, and a lot of people find it at least pretty good. The special effects tend to be quite good, like, somewhat low budget, sure, but th most of them do really hold up to scrutiny you know there's 
vampires getting burnt in sunlight with smoke and scarring and such. I don't think that the the there there are some times where a, a vampire is you know basically on fire and they basically overlay a visual effect of fire. I don't think those were completely convincing. I, you know, it's possible that that looked better in the the cinema. You know, that is the thing. That I, I forget which movie it was, but there was someone who pointed out... Oh, actually, think about it. I think it was D.S. Deacon talking about Return to Oz. He pointed out, you know, if you watch, you know, a recent release of it, then you can make out some of the stuff they did to to hide effects you know and it's because of the the higher level of detail available to home media today compared to when it first came out i do think that it works incredibly well there there are shots where like a stunt performer is partially on fire that looked amazing and I think that might be about right. And some very effective, fairly, you know, yeah, some incredibly effective makeup. Like um, Jesse has this like scar where I, I don't think they ever explain it. But it, yeah, you get the sense that like someone tried to like cut his face open, you know, which, yeah, that's... You, <laughs> You really pissed someone off if they're if they're taking a knife to your face, and the the um, yeah he's got these these like nail these fake nails that have a very like just yeah they they really creep you out. There's some excellent stunt work, and I think that is it for yeah um i rate this seven neo-western horror movies with bite out of ten and yeah it, it would be even higher if the romance either worked better or was a slightly smaller element of the film you know it is it is especially based on just how engaging a uh, watch the movie is you know honestly at least yeah it it earns at least one extra just for like bill paxton and in general the performances are just yeah and i definitely think that the movie holds up and i i do think this is one of those movies that if just the advertising budget had been higher, if more people knew that it existed, I think it would have been a much bigger success. And... Let's see. Yeah, you know, hopefully, you know, it is discovered. Um... Yeah, uh, this feels a little weird to do since I only have two, but yeah, I overall I, I prefer this movie to Strange Days. There we go, and yeah, that brings us to the spoiler section. So yeah, from here on out I am spoiling everything in the movie. So let's start with notes. Uh, oh, hold on. There we go. Notes taken while watching. And yeah, uh, as soon as two men start interacting in the movie, we immediately get macho bullshit. And yeah, you know, it's supposed to be this thing of, oh, you know, Male audience, you like Caleb, right? He's an idiot like you are. 
and yeah, um, there's a lot of great little lines I like. You know, so so he approaches May, who I guess no one told her or her vampire system that apparently vampires in this movie can't handle regular food because um, she's chomping on ice cream. But yeah, um, I'm pretty sure they basically you know they they were like if he's gonna fall for her, let's have her do something with her mouth that like you know have her licking at something. Yeah. And there's also that thing about how, you know, nobody actually appears to have fangs, but we do still see, like, the two marks, bite, yeah, fang bite marks later. I don't think that's really a big deal. Um, I think there was just, like, maybe there was a miscommunication, or they couldn't quite figure out how else to make it clear that it was vampire, or, yeah. But, but yeah, you know, it's, C Caleb approaches her, and I forget the exact line, but it's something like, you know, I would love a bite, or something along those lines. And, you know, yeah, he has no idea he's talking to a vampire. That's not the, the, yeah, if, um... That's not the most, that's not the smartest thing to say to a vampire. Oh, I, I meant to say, yeah, there's 53 quotes in the, the memorable quote section, and they are all great. Yeah, um, let's see, then we have the, yeah, um, you know, Caleb and, yeah, basically, Caleb is trying to seduce me, and I mean, I I don't think it helps the romance that they don't seem to really connect that much. They're kind of talking past each other. Like, you know, the things he's saying are based on the fact that he's not a vampire, he doesn't even know they exist. And yeah, her reaction to that is based on that. And then she'll say, you know, oh, look at that star when, you know, I'll still be here when, you know, yeah, what was it, hundreds of millions of years, whatever, you know. And, you know, he says, I'd like to still be there with you or something along those lines. Did I mention that the, I, I was only able to get this Blu-ray from Sweden. It has Swedish subtitles. I do not read Swedish or speak it. So I, for some of it, I, I'm not 100% certain what exactly it was that was said. I'm used to subtitles that I can read for almost everything I watch. But yeah, the, um, yeah, you know, that has her thinking, maybe if she turns him into a vampire kind of thing. And also, you know, when she realizes, oh, you know, the sun is coming up, you know, he says, what's burning you, or something along those lines. Again, that's, yeah. And, yeah, I'm almost certain that the idea, the reason that she bites him is because she wants to be with him, and the lack of chemistry really, you know, yeah, it's, it's too bad. It, it, that, that could work better if there was more chemistry. Another thing, I can't help but wonder if maybe, I don't know if Catherine Bigelow, considering, you know, again, how these, you know, in, in both this and Strange Days, you have these scenes that are scary for women where we're not really made to empathize as much with the woman as, you know, maybe, um, Jenny Wright did not feel 100% comfortable on set. Uh, you know, it, it, in more recent years, we've come to appreciate more that a number of, like, romance, yeah. You know, it's especially in when it comes to, like, sex scenes, but, yeah, it can also be, you know, they, they like, I forget, come to think of it. No, I'm, I'm pretty sure there's at least one actual kiss between them, and, and yeah, you know, if she doesn't feel completely safe, you know, I mean, if he, you know, what was it, 15 years later in a documentary, he's talking about, oh, you know, I'd cheat on my wife with Jenny Wright, like, 
Maybe he made her feel uncomfortable while they were filming it. Now... Yeah, so about 16 minutes in, the evil family takes Caleb away from the good family. And, yeah, just from right away, like, Severin is so engaging. Just, you know, let's see. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's when the... the yeah, what the fuck is going on? It ain't what's going on, son, it's what's coming off. Your face, clean off. And he says, I'm going to separate your head from your shoulders. Hope you don't mind none. And I think he had at least one more line there. Let's see. Right, yeah, here's the, yeah. Can I have a bite? Bite? I'm just dying for a comb. Dying? And the, let's see. Um... Yeah, I I feel like there was one more line, but I don't remember. Ah, yeah. The um. Oh right. Also, yeah. I sure haven't met any girls like you. No, no, you sure haven't. And the thing with you know who you out here with friends, boyfriend, friends. And, yeah, uh, let's see, then we have, um, yeah, uh, Homer says that, you know, can you imagine being a big guy inside but a little guy on the outside, and Severin whines about, oh, yeah, but we have to hear about it, so, you know, yeah. If you didn't already know Severn was a bad guy, he's one of those assholes who whines about other people's problems because, oh, you know, sometimes I have to hear about those problems. And, yeah, we see Severin, you know, they, yeah, they sw switch cars and Severin is, like, skulking around, very, very creepy, very nicely done. And, yeah, they talk about the Chicago fire, which, like, wow, that's... And, and that's, again, like, yeah, you know, that they, they, they enjoyed that. They think back to that, oh, you know, remember when we did, when he caused all that chaos. And, yeah, so, so Caleb doesn't want to, to join them, so he asks May, let me go, and I'm just like, I mean, she should, but you didn't let her go. And and it's also that thing of, you know, I, I appreciate, you know, a, a twist on vampires, although it's not really that they were... Yeah, it's not that vampires at the time were, like, played out, but there were very specific expectations for vampires at the time, and, yeah, this goes in a different... You know, I, I quite appreciate that, but it's hard to feel... I, I think we're supposed to feel like, oh, you know, May, you know, this... You know, oh, this evil seductress can, you know... You know, she ends up, you know, showing that she's good, or at least capable of good. But I think we're supposed to early on think that, oh, she, she did this awful thing when, like... The... the Obviously, she shouldn't have done it. She shouldn't have, have bitten him. You know, at, at the very least, like, make sure he knows what's going to happen, and then he then you can ask for his consent. But the way he treated her, I, I really don't have a lot of, of sympathy for him. I, I realize that that was common for the, the environment for the time, but that doesn't make it okay. And, and, and it's, you, you know, you could easily, like, one thing, for example, that I would change, when he spots her, you could have it be that they, like, make eye contact, and, like, maybe she smiles at seeing him, or something, just make, you know, and, and, yeah, once they start talking, 
have them actually connect. You can still have, like, little, you know, hints in there that there's more going on, you know, but the, yeah, I've made my point. Yeah, and, and yeah, so, you know, he, the, the movie wants to show, oh, you know, he can no longer take in normal food, but have you had an American chocolate bar? I, I don't blame him for, for spitting it back out. And let's see. Yeah, and he, he tries to go home via bus but has to drop off. And then, as others have pointed out, we get a bunch of Star Wars vibe, wipe transitions, which is a choice. And... Yeah, and the, we have this line about, you know, oh, the, the night is so bright that it will blind you. And I wish that, I, I don't know if it's, I guess it's possible that they ran out of time or budget or some money or something. But I don't think that the movie completely sold that. And I, I kind of wish that they had either dropped the line or changed it to something that just, because, you know, it, it cuts and I was expecting we would see something that would show us how the, the night is blinding because earlier on you know it's mentioned and then let's see I think May says it to to Caleb and he says I don't know what you mean and at the time I was like yeah I I don't see what you know I'm looking at the night sky in the, in the movie I'm not seeing what she's seeing but then we still don't see it here at the actually this might have been maybe this was where the deleted scene was supposed to go and they maybe ran out of time, and that's... I, just, I wish that they had dropped the, the line from that scene. And... Yeah, we see some of how the different members kill for, for food, and... Yeah, you know, if you... It's... You have your work cut out for you if you want to get a... A mainstream audience on board with this kid is evil but yeah Homer you know he's lying down he pretends you know because you know someone's gonna come by and be like oh, this poor kid he crashed he's hurt and then he you know kills them and drinks their blood you know yeah that's yeah um, and Severin is hitchhiking and you know smiling at these women and saying, I'll buy you a drink you know it's, yeah and then we have Jesse and Diamondback in the you know in the car and they you know they think that they're just taking in this one hitchhiker but then another one shows up and they have these threats and there's you know guns pointed at them and Jesse like smiles is like yes this is awesome you know just yeah very very creepy and yeah, the the truck driver is so charming. So we you know, we spend the entire scene just really hoping against hope that he won't end up dead. And ultimately, Caleb can't bring himself to to kill the the truck driver, but May does. And then we see you know great bit of of imagery. We see them standing near these oil pumps that are working and I, I believe those are you know it's it's some kind of pump thing as he is sucking her blood you know so so yeah extracting a liquid that is considered very valuable and yeah that silhouette shot before they enter the bar just glorious and yeah the entire bar scene is just so good you know Severin keeps trying to provoke and let's see yeah and the the bartender's like there's two ways yeah there's two different ways you can leave this bar on your feet or on your back and severin is is loving the the yeah you know yeah being able to to mess with these people before killing them because think about it, we see later they have guns if they wanted to they could kick down the door shoot everyone inside the bar immediately but they don't and this despite the fact that if they take too long on this they might end up 
you know, f racing away from sunlight or something. But this is, you know, this is they they take they take such pleasure in this that they, yeah. And let's see. Then we have the yeah. Caleb says, "Did I do that?" Not a particularly convincing impersonation, but okay. And the, yeah, we got a Yo Mama joke. And, yeah, um, really great stuff with, like, overall, I, I, you know, you know what, honestly, come to think of it, yeah, the, the, I think it's a tie between, so the actor is Robert Winley, and his, yeah, his picture is actually the, the, his hand being crushed by a topless Schwarzenegger. Um, oh, huh, he's in Joyride as well. But yeah, the, the, <clears throat> you know, the, um, oh, wow, and he, he passed, R.I.P. Um, but, but yeah, the, the, um, yes, the, the, um, I, I, it's a tie for me between him getting, you know, beaten up by, by Arnie and then his scene here, because there's so many great little things, you know, Severin knocks over the, the shot glass. And then, you know, oh, get, get him another one. And then he drinks it, spits it out in his face, and just, and, and then he says, you, you have to pay for, for this liquor. And just, yeah, so many such great little, you know, little, yeah, little, little aggressive, you know, passive aggressive, possibly more than passive aggressive little things. And very tense as we see the, the bartender load the the gun and you know later on we yeah once he starts shooting we do see they can actually survive being shot but we didn't know that and i really appreciate that they chose not to to reveal that until after that and let's see Yeah, and it's, you know May seemingly is about to seduce this this guy, and then Caleb comes up and she's like, "He's for you." And I can't. I'm I'm pretty sure that we're supposed to be like, you know, ah, oh, you get him, Caleb. How dare he not realize that she's already with someone else? I I really I. It's such a silly. I've I've. I've tried, I've really tried, but it will never make sense to me how some guys get so mad at guys who show interest in the girl that they're with, even if that interest is being displayed, even if they don't know that this is a, you know, a girl who already has a partner, even if they are showing interest in the exact same way, like, I don't know if it's some kind of sort of self-loathing just being expressed to you know being directed towards another person i don't know um and and yeah ultimately he cannot get himself to to kill the the guy and the guy calls the cops on them later and and we have the yeah and they yeah they burn the bar and yeah, and they talk about, you know, there there's very little time left before sun up. Yeah, and at the motel, you know, the 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 old guy's like, "Didn't you come in here once before?" That's right. I come in here once every 50 years, you know. And that's a nice little moment. I I wouldn't have minded if they spent a little more time on something like that, but yeah, you know, <laughs> Jesse makes an impression. So, yeah, 50 years down the line, he still remembers, uh, yeah. And, yeah, so we get the motel shootout, and I've seen some people say that should be the ending. 
And it definitely is one of those cases where you could see how it could be, but the, you know, the Western element to the film, you know, makes, yeah, it makes a lot of sense that it ends with these confrontations in in public, you know, and, and this thing of, yeah, you know, um... Caleb tries to attack Severin with a truck instead of a gun. You know, to make it bigger and more modern. And... But, but yeah, it's, you know, others have pointed out it's very cool how, you know, the bullets themselves don't hurt the vampires. But the, the holes that... The, the bullet holes letting in sunlight, that can hurt them. It's a you know, cool little way to have a, a shootout still, you know, I've, I've seen vampire movies where people shoot at the vampires and it's like, it's not going to do anything, you know. And yeah, now that Caleb has a gun, he's comfortable with, with killing people. So he's a conservative, basically. And an American conservative, an American white conservative. And... Let's see. Um, yeah, and yeah, he's on fire, gets to the car, and and gets the car to them so they can get away. And we see several signs of acceptance. You know, the the at first it looks like Severin still hasn't accepted him, but then he hands him one of the spurs that he uses to to cut bartender throats, and. <laughs> Homer reaches his hand and then does the the thing. So, you know, to some extent, he still has a childish, you know, yeah. He can still be somewhat childish sometimes. And let's see. Yeah, uh, May and Caleb talk about missing, whether or not they miss the sun and miss being out during the day. And, yeah, and this is when Homer spots Sarah, and the product placement is kind of silly. I, I guess that wasn't as big of a part. I guess back then they just thought, oh, this is just normal. But, you know, she puts in a coin and, t you know, bangs the, the big, you know, yeah, presses the big Coke button. And then we see it from the side, Coca-Cola. And we see it roll down. She picks it up, and it's a Coca-Cola. It's just like... Okay, come on. We we get it. She she wants to get some sugar in her and that was the the least offensive method of getting it into her system. <laughs> I do what I want when I want. It's it's impolite to stare. Just, I appreciate that they they made sure that even she got some really badass lines. And it is true. Um women in the south even even you know yeah a lot of women in the south are, are really they they you know they don't take shit from you know she she only like when he like introduces himself and says we can go watch tv you know that she's you know she's receptive to but before that he doesn't yeah, everything he's, he says and does towards her, she, you know, she's not just, like, yeah. Ah, uh, what's the word? She she stands up for herself, I guess is the, the term. And, yeah, and, and, yeah, Homer brings in Sarah, and then Diamondback puts on the mommy act, and is like, Homer... Look at me when I'm talking to you. What's your name, little one? Ah, Sarah. Um, who are you here with? Ah, and and they're in what number three? Did you get that? You know, just yeah. And let's see. Yeah, and and Homer says, you know, now we're even. Just yeah really really twisted 
And yeah, so these last 30 minutes have disappointed some audience members. And I... I thought they really worked. But I can appreciate that, you know... It is... Once the, the vampire family are not as much, you know, like, like they come back at the end, but there's a little, yeah, the, the, it's just not quite, like, you know, as I mentioned, you know, 16 minutes in is when they, you know, other than me, enter the movie, and then they kind of dominate the movie for a while, and then here at the end, you know, it's basically Caleb taking back control of his narrative. And that wasn't what everyone wanted from the movie. And the only thing I really have a problem with about the blood transfusion is that this idea wasn't really set up earlier in the movie. I do think that would have really made a, a difference if, like, very early in the movie there was some mention of, you know, because it is a movie that does a lot of setup and payoff, well, you know, one of the very first things, possibly the first thing we see, is a mosquito trying to suck some blood from, from Caleb, and, you know, he he kills, you know, yeah, he, like, s smacks it or something, you know, so that's, yeah, it's a movie about vampires, and, and he's bitten maybe ten minutes after that or something, so, you know, it is, I, th I think it would have been, would have been really great if really early on there had been a mention of you know some something that was in the blood and maybe even you know maybe mention transfusion or or almost mention transfusion you know it it could be like you know law um loy his name is loy it could be that, like, you know, he's he's a vet. Maybe one of his animals needs some kind, but it just comes kind of out of nowhere near near the end. Um, and according to IMDb trivia, the idea of curing a vampire via transfusion came from Bram Stoker's Dracula. It's you know, it's an element of the movie that's been rejected by a lot of people because it wasn't as frequent as a lot of other tropes, despite how many of the vampire tropes come from Bram Stoker, you know. But that really goes to show, you know, because I, I haven't seen a lot of people that were like, you know, I know it's in, I know it's Bram Stoker, but I just don't like transfusion. A lot of people just didn't even seem to realize, you know, and, and you know, that's fair enough. I'm, I'm not saying, but... Yeah, that's that's how big like pop culture it's you know because we haven't seen it before because before I read it I'll I'll freely acknowledge you know the the I I read in a review you know the blood transfusion doesn't work and I I was also thinking blood transfusion does that really work for the vampire and then I read IMDb trivia and I was like oh wow fuck me I guess you know so yeah that that is yeah it's it's interesting with with stuff like that. And, and I can understand why it didn't make a huge splash even though it was in that original well, let's see it came from Bram Stoker I guess does that mean that it was in the original book or just that it was like a dropped idea I'm not entirely sure but you know it had been thought of before this movie and yeah you know it's one of those things like I think a lot of people like the idea that a vampire cannot be redeemed, that it is impossible to bring someone back. There's a lot of vampire stories where, you know, anyone who is bitten by a vampire has to end up dead by the end of the story. Now, let's see, then we have, um, yeah, you know, so it's, it's clear that he's been cured and I'm not a parent, but I'm not going to lie. There was a lot of food left on Sarah's plate. As she said, you know, I'm going to bed now. I'm going to wash all the food off the plate. I don't know. I just couldn't help but notice. That's all. 
and yeah, you know, there's a there's a creaky, you know, I, I mean, Caleb knows, right? That's why he's leaving. He knows that there's some there's got to be someone out there making the swing creak. And yeah, you know, the, the lawyer is like, you the the creaky swing can wait. And he's like, mm, I could use some air. Oh, why did I say? It? What does that mean? Why did I say that? That remains my favorite bit in, in Everwood. And then she asks, May asks Caleb, why did you leave? I mean, I guess I just thought that was, that would have been clear. Anyway, and yeah, the, he has to, uh, uh, yeah, Sarah has been taken. He has to catch up to them. But the, the car is dead, so, you know, he's on a horse, because, you know, got to fit that in, since it's part Western. And, yeah, um, the final confrontation between Severin and Caleb is awesome. Using a truck as a, a weapon, you know, I wonder if she got that idea from James Cameron. And the, the Bigelow did. And, and, yeah, just, you know smacks into it very very nicely edited like really sells the illusion you know obviously we don't actually see bill paxton hit by a truck they wouldn't be able to do that safely but yeah very convincing and you know he's he's you know on top of it all bloody he you know rips open the thing and starts ripping stuff out like the gremlin from that simpsons Three hours of horror episode just yeah really cool and the the yeah he manages to to make the yeah i think he he jackknifes it right like the the truck driver told him about earlier and yeah and may still wants to to save caleb but jesse says it's too late and yeah the the bit with the knife you know diamondback throws it but um, yeah, I think it's Sarah. Yeah, Sarah yells, you know, get, gets free and yells, watch out behind you. Just, yeah, she's going to grow up to be a real badass. I just know it. And the, the, yeah, you know, knife gets thrown and ends up inside Jesse's mouth. And he, you know, slowly pulls that just, yeah, really, really cool. And yeah, we see Homer blow up. And then also Diamondback and Jesse. I don't really mind the idea that, you know, may maybe Homer jumped out of the car on purpose. Maybe he didn't mean to. It bothers me a little bit that I can't quite figure out from, from just watching the movie. I, I couldn't quite tell if he meant to or, or not. And that I, I wish, you know, maybe they ran out of time to, to shoot an insert or something that would have yeah anyway and yeah at the end they managed to to rescue May from being a vampire with a blood transfusion I don't know if the idea of blood dif different ah crap what are they what are they called again um A, B positive and all that blood blood type Whatever you know, if if that have even came up, like I, it I I one hundred percent can can get behind the idea that a father and son would have the same blood type, but that her blood type would also be I don't know I guess it's possible that th this is a family of universal donors or something, but yeah. Um, I that that is it for this video. Um, let me know what is your favorite unusual vampire story. And yeah, if you like this video, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page. One, two more links to stuff like relevant playlists. This is just a video for you to watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week, reviewing and sharing spoiled thoughts on a movie. I try to do a daily one of a 
MCU TV show. I am currently almost halfway through season four of Agents of Shield. I'm doing all of them chronologically, though I have already done all of the Marvel Netflix or Netflix Marvel ones. I do a weekly episode of a horror thing, which these days is Ash vs. Evil Dead. I'm quite early in that run. And usually, you know, if, if I can, I try to do at least one weekly video on either a Star Wars show that I haven't already finished. Uh, you know, right now I'm doing Echo instead, since that's, so it's, you know, recent, it's current. And, yeah, uh, recently the Review and Thoughts videos tend to out very similar to this one. In other words, if more of it is like this, you're like. You can check out my back catalog as well as Casimir next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording. I'll catch you next time. I keep odd hours.